By the beginning of 357 BCE, Philip II had safely secured his kingdom and safeguarded it against pretenders and invaders alike. The succession was also now safe with the birth of a son, Ahideus, by his third wife, Philina. In the north, Philip had pacified the unruly Paeonians. In the west, the Dardanians were defeated and the upper liberated, whilst with his southern borders, he secured diplomatic solutions. Yet to be tamed was the coastline, but most importantly, the power that lay beyond it, Athens. Now, in our period, Athens had risen to power with the quasi-empire, consisting of dozens of member cities across the Aegean Sea to protect against Sparta and secondly, Persia. These members joined the League with the assurance that they would maintain their autonomy but had to maintain a donation tribute to the League to maintain membership. It functioned like a common peace where any member that was attacked had other members defend them either from internal or external threats. In addition, each member had a delegate that would represent them in a council, the Snergeron, free of Athenian influence to make decisions for the League. In 359, Philip had enticed the Athenians to withdraw their support for the pretender Aegeus in exchange for the independent clerici and Phippolus. Thus, with this situation, Philip and Athens were nominal allies. Philip, however, had other designs. With his recent conquests, he gained the rich silver mines of Damastium in Upper Macedonia. Although the wealth of the mines had their value, Philip made plans to seize the gold mines of Crenites. Crenites was a colony of the city-state of Thassos of the Thracian Sea. Crenites, however, was well inside the Thracian territory and an important source of wealth for the Chalcidians. To get there into Thrace, Philip needed to go through the southern passes of Amphipolis, for which he had promised to the Athenians. Athens could not have the city. Beyond the strategic need of it for his Thracian campaign, the city ran along important trade and supply routes vital for an autonomous Macedonia. And so, in the next campaigning season of the spring of 357, Philip besieged the city of Amphipolis. Unhappy with his apparent change of mood, the anti-Macedonian faction of Amphipolis sent two envoys, Hyrax and Stratocles, to Athens to plea for them to sail and take over the city, for they preferred a return to Athenian control rather than subjugation under a foreign king. The whole situation sparked massive debate in Athens as for the right course of action, to take the city for themselves, or to see through Philip's plans. In that regard, Philip showed his cunning and had sent a letter to the Athenian people. In it, he wrote that he was merely capturing the city on Athens' behalf so that he may return their rightful land. The people, naively, believed they had misjudged Philip. Apparently, the thought that he might be hoodwinking them did not occur. With the combined effort of scaling ladders, battering rams, and siege machinery, the walled city of Amphipolis fell to him. No mean feat considering the difficulties he and Alexander would have with walled cities later on. The city was looted with Philip's permission, being allowed to keep much of what they plundered for themselves. Philip, however, only expelled a number of pro-Athenian and anti-Macedonian members. The city itself was allowed to maintain its democratic system and soon after themselves exiled some of the same members. Of note, Stratocles from beforehand. In Athens, the expulsion of pro-Athenian leaders raised a number of eyebrows. However, the people believed in Philip's word that he would return the city to them. Philip had other designs and immediately marched to Pydna, an Athenian ally on the Macedonian coastline. It fell quickly, likely due to treachery, a same case for the facade that Philip upheld with the Athenians. Now the Athenians had lost both Amphipolis and Pydna to Philip, all the while believing in his false promises. To save face from this humiliating deception, the Athenians declared war 
And so the war for Amphipolis had started. In this time, Philip had also sought an alliance with the Chalcidian League. Before, they were a major threat on his border. They boasted a large army of 10,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry, dwarfing that of Philip's. As was mentioned before, the Chalcidian League also saw Philip as a threat, offering the Athenians an alliance against them shortly after his ascension, although it was rejected. Now, the tables had turned. Both Philip and Athens sought an alliance in order to defeat the other. It was very possible for Athens to pull in the Chalcidians in an enemy of my enemy is my friend type of alliance against Philip. Thus, Philip knew he had to pull the same trick he pulled on the Athenians. Offer a deal too good to refuse. It's important to understand that the ties between the Chalcidians and the Athenians were already strained. As in 361, the Athenians established clerigies, aggressive settlements at Potidaea and Tyrone. Potidaea being only a couple kilometers away from the leading city of Olynthus. The offer from Philip was that he would seize Potidaea for the Chalcidians, which acted as a major naval base for the Athenians, and he would surrender the town of Athemus to the west of the Chalcidians in Macedonia. Now, it wouldn't be amiss if they saw Philip's recent track record for broken promises and see through a possible deception. They did not. Again, like with the Athenians, the deal was too promising. But on Philip's insistence, they consulted the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi. This oracle was amongst the most important oracular site of the Greeks, and the most important on the mainland. It was typical for many major deals and agreements to consult the gods for good omens. In this case, it was to bind both parties as it was the will of the gods that it should be seen through. If either of them were to break their oath, it was claimed that many evils should fall on those who commit perjury, and so their alliance was brokered. Nevertheless, the Athenians had already secured a number of forces against the upstart king among which included Grabus of the Grabe of Illyria, King Lysias of the subjugated Paeonians, and the three kings of the fragmented Adrusian kingdom, Berisades, Amodicus, and Cursablades. This coalition was no force to scoff off. However, in the same vein, the joint militaries of the Macedonians and the Chalcidians were a threat that would have deemed a substantial Athenian force. The reason for their personal lacklustre response was their own internal war, the Social War. As we mentioned earlier, the Second Athenian Naval Confederacy was a league of a number of polices in and around the Aegean Sea, serving to secure their trade, autonomy, and freedom. In this, a key tenet was Athens foregoing the imperialistic actions of its 5th century empire, the Delian League. One of these said actions was the creation of clerics in the domains of member states. Athens, however, disregarded this a number of times. In addition, the Synedrion, the Allied Council, supposedly free of Athenian influence, was, by this time, wholly in their control. In this situation, the leading members of Chios, Rhodes, Kos, and Byzantium accused the Athenians of their dominating stance and entered open revolt in 356, overthrowing their democratic governments. Like wildfire, the rebellion spread to the other island policies of the Aegean Sea. It also gained further momentum with the backing of the satrap of Caria, Morsalus, the very same Morsalus that would later build the iconic Mausoleum of Helicarnassus. Morsalus pledged naval support and financial aid to the Rhodians. Athens wasn't too eager to simply keel over and let these important areas cede from the confederacy. In response to the growing fleet of the rebelling islands, Athens sent their own fleet, 60 triremes strong, to the island of Chios, where the rebels had assembled most of their fleet. This Athenian fleet was led by the two generals Haris and Havria. Under their command, they set sail and besieged the eastern coast of Chios. The details are sketchy, but from what we know, Havrias died in a naval engagement, 
while Haris managed to command a land assault but was repelled. He was able to withdraw himself only with great difficulty. The rebels, now with this victory under their belt, took the offensive and seized more islands. Of note, Lemnos and Samos. Clearly, the rebellious members posed a greater threat to the Athenian hegemony than securing the city of Amphipolis, hence the seemingly lack of involvement on Athens' part in the war with Philip. The social war, however, would continue with Athens' full attention. In 355, to relieve Hari's damaged fleet, the Athenians sent another fleet, again 60 triremes strong, to Erythrae, near the eastern coast of Chios on the Anatolian mainland. This fleet was commanded by the general Mantheus, Timotheus, and the famous mercenary general Iphicrates. Once the two fleets united, they were met with a terrible storm, typical of the winter Mediterranean. Near them, however, was the Chian fleet, a hundred triremes strong, which was the bulk of the rebel fleet. The commanders, seeing the high winds and the heavy waves, withdrew their fleets, except for Haris. He thought the prize was too great to pass up, as victory would decisively end the rebellion, and so he engaged, much to the other commander's protests, into the fray of the storm and the enemy fleet. Possibly, his thinking was that if they engaged, the storm would hurt the Chians just as much as his. However, his ragged fleet of 60 triremes were easily bested by the hundred of the Chians. The result was the defeat of Athens in the war. Haris only came out of the engagement with a third of his ships. As for the other half of the fleet, it faced similar defeat should it engage the larger Chian fleet on its own. And so, the Athenians came to terms with the rebellious islands. Chios, Rhodes, Kos, Byzantium, and any member who wished became independent. By the end of the year, the social war had ended. The second Athenian naval confederacy became a rump state of its former self. The remaining allies were sparse and spread across the Aegean Sea, none of which were of much note. Returning to Philip in 356, now allied to the Chalcidians and having secured Amphipolis and Pydna, he was about to march on Potidaea to return it to the Chalcidians. Although, before he committed to the siege, an interesting opportunity arose. Early that year, Berisades had passed away. His son, Sotriparus, succeeded him as the king of Western Thrace. Soon after ascending, the new king besieged the gold mines of Crenites, looking to add its wealth to his own. Getting no help from their motherland of Thassos, the mining colony appealed to Philip for aid. Philip was all but too happy to oblige, for now he could secure the gold mines he desired and come there as a defender rather than a conqueror. Philip diverted his full force to Crenites quickly defeating a Thracian force and secured Crenides and the mines around it. In doing so, Philip was redrawing his eastern border with the feuding kingdoms of Thrace, which cemented himself in the dynamic affairs of Thrace. Crenides was Philip's. However, he could hardly stay to fortify the position as the coalition of the Illyrians, Paeonians and Thracians came to a head to seriously threaten the Macedonian homeland. Philip decisively divided his forces in two. One led by himself will deal with Citriparus in the east, the other led by Parmenion would deal with Grabus and Lysias in the west. The details here are few and far between, but from what we gather, Philip defeated Citriparus' force, pushing him to the far east of western Thrace, redrawing his border to the Nestus River. As for Parmenion, he managed to equally subdue Grabus and made Lysias come to heel. Now, undistracted from the invaders at his borders, Philip headed to Potidaea to liberate the city. Akin to Amphipolis before, the siege tactics and engines of Philip made short work at the city. By only midsummer of 356, Potidaea fell to him. Bound by his sacred oath, Philip actually went through with his promise returning the city to the Chalcidians, along with the Macedonian town of Athemus. Unlike with Amphipolis, 
Philip sold the Potidaeans into slavery, except he showed leniency to the Athenian clerics, letting them return to Athens without ransom. Odd, considering he was an open war with the Athenians. Perhaps he thought highly the Athenians because of the glory and the reputation that preceded the city? Or maybe he sought to confuse the Athenians as to his intentions for them, make them doubt the vicious picture of him as painted by the rhetoric orators. Either way, it is impossible to know for certain, and both cases are mere speculation. Regardless, his mercy towards the Athenian clerics drew suspicion among his Chalcidian allies. Philip, now putting the immediate war on hold, turned his attention back to the gold mines of Crenites. Philip returned to the mines, but this time with Macedonian settlers, coming to re-establish the city as his own creation. Crenites was renamed Philippi, Philip's personal colony and the first among many cities to be named after Macedonian conquerors. With the gold mines of the Mount Pingian range secure, Philip transformed the Macedonian economy overnight. The income gained from the mines of Philippi alone was 1,000 talents annually. In comparison, Athens' total net income was around 400 talents a year in this period of time. This income alone was able to fully institute the rigorous training, equipment, and finances that Philip's army required for his dreams of military expansion. Returning to Philip's campaign, Podidia had been returned, Crenides re-established as Philippi, and most of the Macedonian coast secured. All that remained in his path in securing the seaboard was the Athenian ally of Methone. But before this, Philip had gotten the news that another son was born to him, this time from his fourth wife, Olympias. His name was Alexander, third of his name, and the second in line to the Macedonian throne. However, Philip's focus was on the campaign, which was near finished. The city of Methone had been largely independent throughout its history, but allied with Athens in fear of the raging campaign of Philip and was thus his enemy. Its location on the Thermaic Gulf gave easy access for any enemy to enter its ports to the Macedonian heartland, as we saw with the Athenian pretender Argeus in 359. It also had a valuable presence for strategic communications down to the holy site of Diem and through into Thessaly via the Temp Valley. By mid-winter of 355, Philip moved onto the city and besieged it. The siege of Methone proved more difficult for Philip than his previous sieges of Amphipolis and Potidaea. The huge walls were a challenge for the siege techniques of scaling ladders and battering ramps. In addition, Philip's inferior naval strength prolonged the siege. One day, when inspecting the siege craft, the Macedonians were almost defeated. A defending archer by the name of Astor hit his mark. His arrow pierced Philip in the eye, the wound a terrible one as blood poured out of his eye. The king was rushed away to his tent, the entire army halted the siege in anticipation for the fate of their king. In the chaos, the defenders were able to land an Athenian relief force that entered the city. To Philip's endless luck, his life was saved by his doctor, but the wound was not without its mark. Philip's right eye was sewn shut, and the cut of the arrow scarred along the side of his face. However, with Philip's recovery, the siege continued, and in the early summer of 354, the city surrendered. One would think his retribution would be severe on those who made him lose an eye, but Philip showed relative mercy, again, to the defenders. His terms were somewhat light. The city, its walls and all buildings were to be razed to the ground, and the lands were absorbed into Macedonia. As for the defenders themselves, he allowed them to leave unharmed and free, but with only one item of clothing. The coastline was now Philip's. Only in his fourth year as king, Philip had secured the Chalcidians as an ally, transformed the Macedonian economy as amongst the riches of Greece, redefined his eastern border with Thrace, and was winning his war with the Athenians. Philip's sphere of influence was only growing by the year, 
the path was set for Philip's empire, whether he realised it or not. The era of the Macedonian Empire was fast approaching.